morning. I'm Daniel Morales, and I'll be I'm here today with Jen O'Donnell, and we'll be talking about blogging, podcast, and translation in that order. We'll start with some self introductions, and I'll let Jen go first. Oh, okay. Jumping right into self intros. Hi, I'm Jennifer O'Donnell. I'm a localization director for a video game company in Osaka. But before I was working in house, I was freelancing for a few years and have been writing blogs and doing podcasting even while working in-house. And I met Daniel through my blog and his podcast. <laughs> and so that's kind of why we ended up coming up with this talk today. Yeah. And I'm, I'm Daniel. I'm a translator based in Osaka, and I've been writing for 15 years on my blog and have previously worked in a trade association that did some business in Japan and then at a Japanese consulate and also got a creative writing degree as a master's. And... Yeah, so one of the things I think the theme that we'll be talking about today is this kind of the triangle that kind of came up when Jen and I were prepping and this kind of idea of time, effort, money, which basket are you putting which eggs into and how much time, how much effort and how much money do you have to spend on projects? I think that really determines what you can do with them or how you can do them. Yeah, like I personally prefer to spend more time and less money on you know, a pet project. And so I went for a lot of free services while investing a little bit of money in things like microphone or hosting. And we'll go over that a little bit, but picking other things that take a lot more time to get into. So, I mean, if you don't want to put much time or effort into something, then you can invest a little more money. And there are lots of options and we won't be able to go over all of the options available today, but hopefully we'll be able to help inspire people to sort of have an idea with if they want to pursue something like writing or blogging or podcasting and how to start, you know, researching more about it. Definitely. And to start off blogging. So what is blogging? I think it's kind of gotten a bad name because it's associated with personal writing on the internet from the 1990s and the early 2000s. But really blogging is just presenting writing on the internet in some kind of form. And I think Jen and I both agreed that, you know, articles might be a better way to describe what you're doing, especially if you're putting it on a resume or something like that. Web journal is a word that I know that David Marks used for his website, Neo Japanism, which I've, I've written a couple, for a couple of times. And I always thought that was a nice way to put a web journal is something that sounds a little bit more put together. Yeah, I guess, I mean, we all know the power of language. <laughs> blogging sounds so dirty and web journals sounds really fancy, but also things like blogging, like we're just using as a casual term in this presentation as Daniel said, for articles, web journaling, but also things like websites or newsletters, things like that. Exactly. I think you can also embrace the word blogging. I've tried to, I think if you embrace it and just say, I've been blogging for about Japanese for 15 years, 10 years, you know, something like that. So speaking of blogging, how did we get into blogging? So I guess I'll start with when I was in university, I decided to kind of keep an online diary for my friends and my family while I was studying abroad. And it was on like, blogger.com I which I think is still going so it wasn't really anything special but it got me into writing online and then while I was at university I was teaching people Japanese for my local you know anime society and when I graduated I was like oh, I want to keep doing this because I really enjoyed it and so I combined blogging with teaching Japanese and created Japanese talk online because offline it was Japanese talk, so Japanese talk online. And that's been going for over 11 years now, I've realized. And then when I started translating, I decided to do the same thing where I created a website and developed articles. I guess that technically started on LinkedIn. And then somebody said, oh, do we have a website we can link to? And I was like, no, but that's a good idea. I think I might do that. And so I turned my LinkedIn articles into a website and turned that into a professional translation website blog. And that's been going for eight years now. <laughs> Time flies. It does. Man. Yeah, my story is somewhat similar. I actually had a really bad experience writing my thesis in college and it had kind of gotten burned out on writing and wasn't very good at it either. And so was kind of determined not to do any writing for my career, which is kind of ironic given where I've ended up. But I still had this like desire to write. And so I, I went on jet when I finished and I was like keeping a live journal I was kind of irregularly, but I tried to start blogs. I tried to start a recipe blog for Jet. And other times during my writing career, I tried to start blogs because there's that kind of like need to communicate or that desire to make 
a new project or something like that. That I felt very strongly and still feel pretty regularly. And when I was on Jet, luckily, one of my fellow Jets asked me to write for the prefectural newsletter about language or something like that. And or I can't even remember what he asked me, but I was like, okay, yeah, I could put together like a language lesson. I had gotten kind of frustrated with, with some of the things that other people were seeing as difficult about the Japanese language. And I said, well, Maybe if you looked at it this way, and I was trying to explain a different way of looking at the language. And those articles, I had so much fun writing. I did two of them, and they were pretty long. And I ended up putting those as the very first blog posts on my website when I started it 15 years ago, actually, this month, February 2008. And then that's when I put up those initial posts. And then from March, I started putting up posts regularly. But I found that writing about Japanese really energized me in a way that no other writing did. And it forced me to do the editing work that I needed to do to produce better writing. And then that, I think, gave me the repetitions that I needed to become a better writer. And so, yeah, I leave a trail of dead blogs behind me, but I'm really proud that I tried and was able to recognize, okay, these aren't working and then close them up. So the next topic we'll do is being a blog. The one thing that, that really, for me, was important was finding that topic that energized me. That gave me all the momentum I needed to keep going. And similarly for me, it was, yeah, the things that I was passionate about. Like once I found topics that I wanted to write about, I wanted to write more. And so it's really, it's also a matter of what you want to read. It's like Daniel said, like you see things that other people are struggling with. You're like, Why has nobody written about this before? I'm Googling this and I can't find any information about it. You know what? I'll just do it myself. And then sort of write about things that you would personally find interesting that get you excited. So we discussed it a little bit. Like, don't try to think of, oh, if I write this, then these people will find it interesting and then I'll get loads of work. If you do that, it never works. <laughs> Whereas if you write things that you're passionate about, other people who are also passionate about it will link with it. I think that's really important. Yeah, I'm jumping off. <laughs> definitely. I think you build a readership naturally that way rather than artificially trying to adapt content for an audience. And speaking of building a readership, I think you build it by regularly having content, training the reader to know that if they open your website, there's going to be something there, whatever it is, once a week, once a month, whatever it is, they know it's going to be there. And for me, I started it three times a week, which looking back was, seems like a lot, but it was, they were actually very short blog posts at first. You know, at first that was about as much as I could write. I couldn't maintain that longer, you know, length, but now I think I'm regularly writing, you know, at least 800 to 1500 words, if not longer, and especially with some, you know, training from the Japan Times with their word counts about 900,000 words, I got used to that kind of length of content. And then one other thing I did before I started the blog was I wrote 10 blog posts. I was like, let me write 10 posts that I'll have as a bank that I can go to and cash that in if I need to, if I can't write something one week, or if I get busy, that gives me something to fall back on. And I feel like that was like a bit of a safety net that kind of gave me the confidence to keep going that first year. Yeah, similarly, I think I started once a week. And, and then now that I've got a full-time job, I don't have as much time to fit into it. And once a month, for either one of the blogs, so really it's like once every two months for one blog and once every two months for another. And then also the Japan Times. So like, I feel like I'm constantly writing, but it's so sporadic that it's for a whole bunch of things rather than focusing on one, which is another thing that you can think about. I mean, it doesn't always have to be one thing that you focus on, but yeah, schedule and building up reader expectation helps. But I think it's also important to not beat yourself up if you miss one or two. I know that was a big problem for me. It was like, I have to, I have to write this. I have to get something out. And it was just making me miserable because like we were saying, you want to write something that is enjoyable it's fun and if you turn it into a chore then it doesn't it's not fun anymore yeah it's a yeah. delicate balance because sometimes those limitations can really help generate creativity like a word count a limited word count can force you to be a deadline can force you to get something out but at the same time you don't want to be forcing out bad writing you've got to let something breathe put it aside let it ferment a bit, come back to it with a fresh set of eyes. Kind of like translation. Yeah. <laughs> when you do something and then you leave it alone, you go back and you're like, oh my goodness, what does this even say? Yeah. I think one thing that can be beneficial for that is varying the length of your posts, like doing some short posts, some medium posts, some long posts, because that way the reader's not going to get exhausted. You're not going to exhaust yourself. Having like a uh, short posts that are part of a regular series. Also, if you can think of, you know, 
some kind of series of posts that you're going to post about regularly and you can think up five or six topics right away even if you haven't written those articles you know okay well i'm going to write these six articles and that way if you're not feeling if you're feeling a little bit tired or down one month you've got something ready to kind of go to and then on the other side longer medium and longer posts i think uh, really kind of like pushing yourself to try something new. For me, it was the 1Q84 live blog. When that came out in 2009, I was kind of like starting to make connections with my blog, share it out there, getting readers. And so when the Murakami novel came out, I did a live blog, which on other websites, I think was a little bit more professionally done where basically you would do like a, a timestamp and you would add new information. And it looks like a chat if it's done correctly, except it's a one-sided chat with people just adding comments. And so at the time, People were doing it for sporting events and just television shows. This was kind of before Twitter really blew up and before YouTube had like chat within the video. And so that was something that people were doing. And so I did it for a whole weekend reading that book and got a lot of traffic from that. And that was eventually how I connected with the Japan Times. So I think pushing yourself and trying to do bigger, exciting things like that is another good way to kind of not only challenge yourself and have fun with the blog, but also really kind of connect with readers. And if you think something isn't really working, don't be afraid to give it up. Like I've got a whole folder of articles that I've dropped because I was like, yeah, this is a great idea. And then got halfway through them. I was like, ah, I don't really care anymore. <laughs> or like Daniel was saying, if you're not again, enjoying it, it's fine to drop it. Mm -hmm. Like really. I think successful blogging, successful websites, successful articles are when you write something for you. And if it doesn't spark joy, <laughs> don't yeah. do it. Yeah, it, it's sad to see Haikyo blogs. Although at the same time, it's nice to kind of go back and go through them. It's sad when you see a blog that hasn't updated for a while. So yeah, I, I closed my recipe blog. I had How to English for a while and I closed that. And then I wrote a book about home brewing and put that published that on Amazon. And I had a blog associated with that, closed it up. What else? Yeah, I think like, you know, find your core. I think you really have to focus on your core and kind of always be asking yourself, okay, where where is my where are my strengths? What is my focus? What what do I need to be doing now? Because it can be tempting to start new projects. Starting new projects is a very intoxicating feeling, I feel like especially for creative people. Yeah, okay. sure. Anything else here? I think we're good to move on. That's about it. And we can always come back to these topics too. And if people have any questions, of course, we'll the, go questions at the end. Sure. So yeah, promoting a blog. Jen, I don't think I realized that you started blogging on LinkedIn. I feel like that's, that's really 2015. So that's pretty early on. I feel like you've seen that a lot in the last couple of years. And so now are you sharing links to your posts on LinkedIn? Yes. So I started writing, like when I started as a freelancer, I got really involved in LinkedIn, sort of involved in the communities there and the groups and writing, you know, various fluff pieces and just things that just random thoughts. And one of them was how great this video game translation was and how amazing like the wordplay was. And the people who worked on the translation was like, oh, do you have a website? And that gave me, like I mentioned, the idea to start up the website itself and to start a blog on that. And then now I do on LinkedIn. I mostly use Twitter. Twitter was really great for building up a reader base and an audience and finding people in your community who are related. I think I know a lot of people in the Sweat group. I think I found Sweat through Twitter. And but you know, like Daniel was saying, live live blogging isn't really a thing anymore. Live journal isn't a thing. Twitter is slowly going out the door. And so it's always about finding finding a social media platform that you connect with that you enjoy using that you can find a community through and then using that to be like oh I wrote this cool thing if anyone's interested here you go <laughs> yeah one thing we don't have listed here I think is discord which I think can be really powerful it's Twitter was the way that I initially got connected with a lot of people and that's how I connected with Jen I think I was just just following her posts on Twitter Facebook too there's like LinkedIn there's interest groups that you can post to similar to sweat but also you can start a page for your blog. And that's what I did. I haven't had too much traction there in terms of getting a conversation going, but I do think Discord has, a lot of people are moving to Discord in terms of creating a group for their project alongside a blog. 
And that can be, you know, membership based. So you can charge people to be part of that discord or it can be free. You can join other. discord yeah. groups. Like I'm in a couple for translators and different mm -hmm. special interest groups as well. Like I'm in translation groups and video game development groups and video game writing groups. And it doesn't have to be just translators. I guess it also depends on what you're interested in. Like if you're really interested in origami or some other like brewery, like home brewing, and you want to write about that and then find people who are also interested in it. And then you can kind of connect your different fields of interest together, like Japanese home brewing versus American home brewing versus English home brewing. Just as an example, I guess one of the great things about you know, writing a blog and promoting it through social media is that you find all these connections that you probably weren't expecting. And through that, finding not only people, but more interesting things about the topics that you're interested in. And so really expanding your own knowledge as well as your own like community. Yeah. And it's funny, you know, sometimes I think people call like networking a kind of a negative word, but I do feel like if you can switch that to a more positive kind of participating in the conversation. That's kind of how I like to think of social media and promoting a blog. I think participating in the conversation in some form is kind of necessary if you want to be a blogger. I remember I talked with a guy in Sweat who had a really great Japan-based blog, but he just wasn't getting much traction on his post. All the posts were actually pretty good. The website looked really good, way better than mine, to be honest, but he just wasn't having much traction. I was like, well, what are you doing on Twitter? And it was nothing like he was putting out links, but you have to kind of go out there and bump into people a little bit, not in a rude way, but just kind of like, Hey, what's up? You know, like, Hey, how's it going? You know, you have but to you, comment on people's, you have to reply to people. Yeah. Right? But you can also tell those people who are like doing it for networking, like with a capital like, N, yeah. like I've met some yeah. people and I'm like, you're just, you're just talking to me because you don't actually know me. You're not interested in me. You're just trying to have me as a connection and I can tell. Yeah. It needs to be authentic. You need to come from that core place of something that's really driving you, I think. Like, yeah. I find you really interesting. This is really cool. Exactly. And I, another good example, my mom is really into cross-stitching and they have an incredible community that's built through like Instagram and YouTube. There are ways to do it if you want to put in the time or the effort, you know, which platforms can you participate in? TikTok is huge right now. You can really kind of blow up there and, and things are a bit disproportionate there's a singer songwriter on tiktok who's got you know 100,000 followers but he only has 4,000 on instagram so there are ways to kind of leverage each platform in different ways if you can kind of get out there and figure out the rules how they work but participating in the conversation in some form i think is necessary and i think that's what writing is you know that's what writing is in and of itself participating in the conversation so it's not something you don't know how to do or you can't do so if you can shift your mindset a little bit on promotion i think that can be helpful which actually feeds in nicely into our next point, sort of the nitty gritty, researching the best things for you. Again, putting in the effort, putting in the time. And if you don't want to put so much time and effort in, putting in the money to find something that really works for you. Like if you don't want to create your own website and you don't want to create your own blog, but you really want to write, there are other platforms like the Sweat website, or you could find special interest groups they're related to the topic that you're interested in, like home brewing or origami or something like that. And then being like, oh, can I write for your website? I've written this article. Would you be interested in it? Things like that. You don't have to create a website from scratch. You don't have to put in hundreds of hours of work just to create this one thing if you don't think it's worth it for you. There are other avenues to explore. Yeah. That said, it's never been easier to start a blog. Uh, That's you, true. you know, WordPress and Blogger are really the kind of core platforms, I think, but there are a lot out there and you can get on and get a website going in five minutes, you know, and they have some really nice looking templates that make it look pretty slick. So personally, I do a self-hosted WordPress installation on my host is namecheap.com. I've found them to be really reliable and relatively relatively affordable and they do just about everything. One time my website got hacked and deleted and they were able to basically pull up the saved version of it and I lost almost nothing. So that was great. And yeah, so I would say, think about the platforms, think about how you want to do it, put some time and research into it. And Jim, what is your setup like? Oh, so both my blogs, websites made through WordPress.org. So you, you have you have two different WordPresses. They've got WordPress.com. They will provide you with a template and they will provide you with hosting and they'll set everything up for you. So it's very, you know, beginner friendly. 
But on the flip side, it's not so good for search engine optimization or for people who are really serious about making websites. I WordPress.org, you have to find your own host. You have to find your own sort of theme or template to create your website on, but it gives you a lot more freedom and flexibility with the creation as well as a lot more back-end hands-on stuff that lets you really, you know, have it appear easily on social media. But the learning curve for .org is a lot higher than .com. So if you don't want to put loads of time and effort in than .com, WordPress.com is definitely a lot easier to get into. I would suggest avoiding like website creation websites like Wix. I don't remember if Wix is still a thing. Squarespace and stuff like that. Those kind of websites, they do make it really easy to create a website. But on the flip side, because they've got a lot of batting code, it makes it harder for people to find when they search on social media or not on social media, on like Google. So the search engine optimization isn't as ideal, but if you don't care about that so much, then maybe it is a good option for you. And that's what we mean by like researching. And if you look for things and you feel really bogged down, you're like, I have no idea what I'm doing. You you can ask people around you as well. I wouldn't mind giving some pointers if anybody wants to email me and ask for more information on this stuff because WordPress. the community is here to help as well. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, and WordPress is not that hard. I would say, I, yeah, I only know a little bit of HTML, a little bit of CSS, and that's really all you need. I think obviously if you know more PHP or SQL, it's a database driven kind of system. I don't know any yeah. code. I know a little bit of HTML, but there but, are ways that you can find, te- you can download templates and widgets. They're called that help, you know, create a website really easily. Yeah. But, but if you know those, you can maybe do a little bit more with WordPress. Yes. But you, don't, you don't need them. And the templates, even for WordPress.org installation, it's very easy to get a template and switch templates. I do have one story about WordPress.com. It's a good way to say, okay, is this a project I want to do? Let me try this out on WordPress.com. And actually, that's how I started How to Japanese. It wasn't on WordPress.com. It was on a kind of equivalent site that was using a WordPress kind of blogging system. And I liked the template. And that was the only reason I picked it. But once I bought my own domain, that's the most complicated thing I've ever done was switching that over to a self-hosted installation. But I somehow managed to do it and even get all my Japanese text to come along with me. But with WordPress.com, I started a website about Kickstarter. That was one I forgot to mention that I also deleted, but it was about Kickstarter. I got really excited about Kickstarter there for a couple of years. And I connected with a lot of people actually through that, other people who were blogging about Kickstarter, who are interested in Kickstarter through WordPress.com and some, some of their hashtagging, I think, there is a community built in there that you can use, even if it, maybe the search engine quality isn't quite as good. It's a good way to test drive a blog and see what you think. And then you can switch it over. But also WordPress.com, they enable you to do things like buy your own domain so that you're not hosted at something like howtojapanese.wordpress.com. You know, you've got just your domain. Yeah. So WordPress is also used by a lot of professional sites. So mm-hmm. knowing how to use it can be a plus, I would say. But at the same time, you know, I think new Newsletter services are something we should mention yeah. because it's another good platform that's starting to become more and more used. They effectively look like a blog when you're on the website, but at the same time, you're able to send these out to readers. You have access to a list of emails that hopefully you're not taking advantage of for nefarious reasons. And you have a better sense of who your readers are, how many people are reading your content, what kind of content they're looking at, which is stuff you can do with data analytics on a blog that requires not too much coding stuff, but you know, Google Analytics has become a bit of a, a beast. And I do feel like it's a Ferrari that I don't know how to drive well, that's kind of sitting in my garage, but I, I need to kind of go and update that. I actually have gotten a couple of emails about how they're changing some stuff. But Jen, what are your thoughts on newsletters and data analytics for blogs? So I, I have Google Analytics set up, which is basically a way for Google says, okay, you've got this many clicks, you know, a month, a year for these kinds of people in these different countries. And I I keep track of it just because I think it's interesting, <laughs> but I keep writing what I want to write. It doesn't really impact how I write, but I, I have been thinking newsletters are getting more popular or at least setting up an RSS feed, which is an, again, a way that people can be like, I want to, you know, be notified whenever you post something, especially if like in my case, it's very irregular, I post. <laughs> and so having a newsletter or an RSS feed where users can, you know, get an email paying every single time you write something. I have been thinking about doing that more, but again, it's the time and the effort. And do I want to put in that time and effort right now? I think eventually, but you know, it's not something I personally need to do right away. Yeah. 
One other thing that some of these uh, newsletter services allow you to do is monetize your content. For example, I think they take, I don't know exactly how the details work because I haven't done it, but they, they take a portion of what your subscribers pay to you and you get the rest. And so you can, you know, charge them annually or monthly, you know, or you can read for free. It also gives you the ability to put out some free content and some premium paid content that is only accessible by subscribers. So you're kind of incentivizing people to subscribe. My thoughts there were that you, you have to hit a certain number for that to make any sense. You know, I would say if you're not hitting a thousand subscribers or more, it doesn't make any sense to do that. Or if you're not posting regularly enough, I think you need to be posting at least once a week for a subscription model to make sense. But as a freelancer, you can turn yeah. it into part of your business for sure. Exactly. And I think we'll probably discuss that a little more later and how you can turn a blog or a podcast into a part of your business. Yeah. And Patreon is another platform that yes. was not initially a blogging platform that has kind of turned into a potential blogging platform that like newsletters will give you some access to your readers, get a sense of how many readers you have, will allow you to kind of email people with when new content comes out, things like that. Very powerful video capabilities there. And then there's podcast integration as well that I haven't experimented with, but is available. Yeah, I used to have Patreon for the Japanese website and I ended up shutting it down because I felt really guilty for charging people. Patreon, basically it lets people subscribe, pay you for content so you can either charge them once a month for content or for every like say every article you post people will pay a dollar or five dollars there's one guy who posts really short comedy skips about japanese and dogen dogen yes and he also releases lessons for pitched accent and people pay him ten dollars a month and he makes like 10 grand a month off of that so he's turned it into a very successful business <laughs> yeah. but again it's the effort and the time that you want to put in yeah. but that's also loads he, of options for that his pitch accent content is incredible but i also know that he's gotten to the point where he's actually hired an assistant to help him with some of that content mm -hmm. and so i mean that's he's got a day job too but he's gotten so successful with this the content he's providing video content in his case that it makes sense for him to carve out a piece of that money that he's making off that to take that effort burden and time burden. So he's buying time and effort with some of that money, which I think is an incredibly smart decision because his content is great, but how is it going to be something sustainable? Is this going to be something that he can keep doing with a family, with a day job without that help that I think he's getting? Yeah. But I mean, even if it's not sustainable, if it's what he wants to do, right? Yeah. Is it sparking joy? And he seems to really enjoy yeah, yeah. Creating little silly little skip videos. Mm. But yes. I think that might be it for blogging. Let's see. Thanks oh, no, the current state of our blog. Yeah. So, um, what are our blogs? Right now? Yeah. Yeah. We kind of mentioned these already. It's yeah, both my blogs are still going, both my websites are still going. But, you know, I have a full time job. My priorities are elsewhere. And so I've really cut back. But I do try to still keep up regular posting because I really enjoy writing and I enjoy talking about the things that I talk about. <laughs> Yeah, I'm at the same point. I'm once a month on how to Japanese pretty regularly. And I started a Substack during the pandemic. I want to say like maybe, I can't remember exactly when, but I've been doing it for close to two years now, I want to say. And I initially started the Substack kind of with the idea that I'm going to be leaving my job. I came over on the IUC language program and the goal was to go back and do freelance translation work, but also freelance writing work. And what would be a, a way to strengthen my portfolio as a writer would be to write about something else that I know a lot about, which was homebrewing beer. I was really into spirits at the time. And so I was writing the newsletter with two articles every month, one about Japanese and one about brewing beer, alcohol content. And that's not going to be sustainable. So I cut the, the booze part of that which I think was a smart decision. But I like this sub. And now that I've kind of unexpectedly got this full-time job in-house, I'm still keeping it up. But I, it does feel sustainable. You know, some months I'll take it easier on myself and do something easy. But being in Japan, to be honest, has made generating content or ideas for what to write about much easier because I'm mm. using the language much more regularly than I was in Chicago. I remember there were times when I was in Chicago Chicago, where it was like, oh, what am I going to write about? And I would just have to turn on NHK news or something. I was listening to NHK news regularly, so it wasn't a big lift for me or doing something different out of my routine. But I had to be a little bit more active in terms of, okay, what was I writing? What was I going to write about? Whereas now I feel like I've already got two or three months ahead of time. I know kind of what I'm going to be doing. And 
if I have another idea in that time, I'll just push that out further. And that's kind of like what that original, you know, set of content I had, those 10 posts, it's a kind of a bit of form of that, you know, you have to, I think being a little bit mindful about what you're writing, it can be hard sometimes, but if you can train yourself to be mindful and take that step back from experiencing something and then being like, okay, what was I experiencing? How is that going to be useful? That was a moment that I think was important. And remembering to take a note about it is sometimes the hardest thing to do. I mean, like, okay, I have to write this down right now so I don't forget what that cool word was. I remember there was a phrase at work the other day that I heard and I remembered it in the chat. I was chatting with Jen actually, but I'm not gonna, I don't think I'm gonna write about that, but it reminds me of that. And I didn't take a note of that when I heard that phrase the first time, but I wish I had because it would have been a useful phrase at work just for potential future work situations. But well, something like that, making sure you're journaling, making sure I'm taking notes for me is a really important so part. What you're saying is like finding inspiration for things that you want to write about in the world around you. Yeah, I feel like that for me was the hardest thing has become a little bit easier. And I feel like that's, so for me, maintaining the current pace of once a month, not too bad with a full-time job. Yeah. Okay, moving on, podcasting. This is really exciting, I think, because a new medium, you know, it's really blown up in the last five to 10 years mm -hmm. and is basically just presenting content via audio. I think there's a million, just like there's a million different types of blogs, there's a million different types of podcasts and you can really do what you want with it. And it Any involves podcast? a whole new, a whole different set of interests and different skills. If you don't like writing and you like just talking, yep. it's definitely good for that. And if you like putting together, if you like editing video, for example, you might like editing audio as well. Okay. I have a, a, honestly a, a silly little podcast called Recommendations for My Otaku Spouse, which I do with my otaku spouse. And we recommend things to each other and then we talk about them and forget to tell people about it because it's like it's a podcast for us. And if people want to listen, then they can listen. But really, I don't care if anybody does or doesn't because <laughs> it's not for them, it's for me. And then Translation Chat was more of a serious podcast <laughs> that I tied into my website and my blog where I talked to professional translators about you know their favorite translations and what made that translation really good in their opinion and so it's kind of a discussion about you know from a professional standpoint what makes a good translation in the different mediums mostly entertainment sort of focusing on novels movies anime manga that kind of stuff yeah, yeah i would object i would say it's not a silly little podcast i would say <laughs> i'm probably one of the biggest fans of my talk spouse uh, i'll tell y'all why a couple of slides later, because I think there's a lot of things that they do really successfully that are best practices for a podcast. For me, I've been obsessed with podcasts since around 2006 when I got my iPod. You know, I've been listening to podcasts since the days when you had to drag them from iTunes over into your iPod. And so I think in the same way that I was, you know, obsessed with reading and writing, kind of that desire to connect and be part of the conversation. So at some point when I was in grad school, I was just extremely depressed and bored. And so I did like one episode on SoundCloud. SoundCloud is another a platform I think we'll mention that's a potential, an easy first podcast if you want to kind of get it running and set up quickly, want to give it a shot without paying much money. Didn't really follow through on it after that initial episode. And it wasn't until 2019. It, my idea at the time was like, well, I'm not going to get a PhD or another master's or something. Let me try and do a podcast. It's going to be something that I know I want to do, I have a really good idea for, and it would be fun. And so yeah, I've done two seasons so far and have taken a break between them and gotten really busy. And so I was glad that I did limited season runs because they are a heavy lift. I would say much heavier than a blog and they really kind of take over your life. I can't imagine doing one once a week, for example. That seems like it would be exhausting. So yeah, let's see. I was just going to say I did yeah. something similar. Okay, with translation chat, I planned 10 episode seasons. Yeah. And early in the year, I spent three months, you know, messaging people and then interviewing them and then spent a couple of months editing. And then at the end of the year, released them all like once a week. So I had that regular release schedule <laughs> very briefly. But yeah, it involved a lot of work and a lot of planning, which is why I'm not doing it again this year because I don't want to put that much effort in this time. <laughs> Yeah, no, totally. I did this. I did limited seasons. The first one was 10 episodes, kind of like, you know, the core of my podcast was interviewing people about how they learn Japanese and kind of wanting to, to dig into that, show people that learning Japanese is something you can do a million different ways. Mm -hmm. There's no set way to do it. 
It's uh, a really good podcast. You should go listen to it if you haven't. <laughs> nice guests on there like Jen O'Donnell. So I think doing a limited season is a smart way to dip your toe in. Yeah. Even if it's like five episodes, you know, what can you do? I think that's a way to kind of like limit the commitment to it, to give it a shot. And also, you know, it's maybe you get halfway through it and you're like, okay, this isn't working. Let me, or do I need more time? Maybe I don't want to limit myself to like, maybe just, you know, do it more slowly and I'll release it when it comes out. You know, there's no rush, but I think coming from that core, again, like with blogging, if you're not coming from that place of authenticity, that desire, that's something that's really, that you need to communicate. You feel like is that you can uniquely communicate. I feel like Mm. it would be a tough lift if you're doing it on your own. Yeah. I mean, translation chat, I'd known for two years, I wanted to do a podcast on translation. And every single time I sat down to like, think about what I wanted to do, I couldn't, like nothing really inspired me. And then I came up with this idea of, oh, what makes good translation? You know, there's so much negativity. How can we have a positive conversation about it? And then it sprung board from there, but it took two years to come up with the idea and to actually get going. So if you're interested in it, you don't have to do it right away. You don't have to put a lot of effort in right from the start. It's something you can build up very slowly. Yeah. Took some time and did some interviews. I think I had like all the interviews scheduled and like five or six recorded or something like that, or maybe even all of them recorded before I started releasing them. But yeah, thinking about like spending that time to think about who you're trying to target, Mm -hmm. you know. I think that's critical. Yeah, listening to a lot of podcasts, if that's not something you're doing, I think that you shouldn't start one before you're listening and thinking deeply about how these podcasts are being run. And I think the biggest decisions for starting a podcast are two. One, are you doing prepared content versus off-the-cuff content, improvised content? And are you doing it alone or are you doing interviews? I think those are the two biggest decisions because I think those are the biggest variables. For sure. Yeah. So for example, Jen and I both have interview podcasts. I think also because, so before I started, I listened to a lot of podcasts and I tried to listen to like ones that are an hour and a half to three hours long. And I'm like, I can't be bothered to listen to these. <laughs> and so I would never, ever actually let's finish those. So I was like, if I do one, I don't want it to be an hour and a half. I will do aim for 30 to 40 minutes. The translation chat ones vary between 40 to a ma- Some of those did end up going to an hour and a half, but I edited them down to closer to an hour because I was like, I personally don't want to listen to the ones that are that long. So I'm not going to make one that's that long. <laughs> Nobody has time in the day for that. Unless you're freelancing and you can listen to people talking while you're right, which I cannot either. So it's like, yeah, it's, it's listening to what's out there. What do you personally like? What do you not like? What would make something that you would want to listen to personally? Kind of just like a blog. What would you write that you would want to read? Yeah, my goal was to do 45 minutes to an hour. And with the second season, I separated out the prepared content. I, with the first season, I had basically a blog post that I read out, followed by the interview. And for the second season, I separated those out to kind of make the episodes some short, some long, but also because of the way that my podcast host did data, I needed to make shorter episodes so that I didn't meet my data limit. And man, I feel like with writing, I've gotten to the point where I'm pretty confident in my writing, but with podcasting, it's, I think it's really hard, especially if you're doing content on your own. Cause you, I mean, I think we listen to people like, you know, sportscasters who are doing these long monologues, you know, on shows. That's really hard. You start, you listen to it and it sounds so effortless, but it's really, really hard. You're, you're probably not seeing a lot of the mistakes they make. You're not also seeing a lot of the training that they've done to get to the point where they're able to talk confidently on a topic without preparation improvised. And then at the same time, if you're doing prepared content, being able to read that in a way that sounds natural and not like you're reading it right off the page. Those are all hard skills to develop, I want to say. I think that's Um, why the interview style is actually very easy because you can, like this presentation, you can bounce conversations off of each Exactly. uh, Like people and so you don't have to script the whole thing you can plan a couple of questions and then kind of direct the conversation I was on one podcast I really wish I hadn't done where the person had like sent me prepared questions and he just asked me those questions he's like did it did it did it and it didn't feel like a conversation it didn't feel like a a flowing dialogue and so I was like I really wish I hadn't done this this is so bad yeah I think (laughs) the people you have chemistry with too is really critical and I think that's why my otaku spouse works so well <laughs> because you've got great chemistry. And I mean, that's what I'm listening for. I think we'll show a list of the podcasts we recommend later. And I was thinking about it and it's like, they all have these, this amazing connection because they're actually friends with these people. And you can tell like if a podcast 
that I listen to if he has a guest on that is like maybe slightly outside of his area of interest. It's just not interesting, you know, like you can tell when that's not there, but thinking about, you know, what your strengths are, who you have chemistry with, who you could have on, things like that are, are things you want to be considering uh, when you're thinking about the podcast. Okay, yeah. <laughs> on to the next thing is the actual recording of the podcast. Yeah, you need a microphone. Yeah. But when I started, I got a really, I say a really cheap, I think I invested like 40 or $50 in a microphone. And then after doing it for a year or two, I was like, you know, I actually want to upgrade. I want to invest in some things like that, which I'm using today. My shiny blue Yeti. I love it so much. It was 14,000 yen, but I used my older Bashi camera points cut on it. So it wasn't too expensive, but yeah, you can really invest a lot of money in these things if you want. But again, I invested in something more expensive when I realized I was going to do this for a lot longer than three months. <laughs> Yeah, I initially, I think I bought a Yeti, but I couldn't get it to sound right for some reason. What? Computer <laughs> and like, so I was recording with it and it just didn't sound right. And so I went to this website, podcastage.com. I don't know how to pronounce that. And I just went with one of the 30, $35 mics that he recommended. That sounds and pretty good. Yeah, no, it's great. He's got a lot of really good audio recommendations. So there's a lot out there. You don't have to start that expensive. And, you know, you can even use something like AirPods, but I would say, a wired mic is going to be better than an unwired mic every day. So you could even start with the wired headphones that come with your iPhone. Those actually sound pretty good. And a lot of people on TikTok use them. And then, yeah, software. There's a lot of free software out there. The, the two main software are Audacity and GarageBand. I think Jen and I use opposite ones. I use GarageBand. It's I free use Audacity. <laughs> yeah. But you can get Audacity for Mac, too. And they're really powerful. Audacity, I tried starting with it, but it was a little bit over my head in terms of yeah. like... It's very powerful. Yeah. It has a lot of options, which can be very overwhelming. But, you know, again, I have friends who podcast. So I messaged them and I was like, how do I do this? And they were like, oh, well, these are base the these are the basic settings you want. And then you can jump off of there. Or there are loads of websites and tutorials. Again, yeah. again, another theme is researching and putting, if you want to put the time and the effort in to find yeah. these tools and to learn how to use them, it can be good. If you don't want to put the effort in, you can invest in software that you know pretty much does all the hard lifting for you yeah speaking of which this zencaster i think is one that we've both used on the crew of japan podcast that's a podcast run i think by the the jet alumni association of new orleans and friends of that community basically people interested in japan and new orleans and zencaster it's run by three or four people and so Zencaster is cloud-based website based and everyone logs into zencaster kind of like they would log into zoom it enables you to take multiple, record multiple audio tracks for multiple people. And that way you can edit if you know, you're know you not talking over somebody, you can edit out some background sounds on people's from people's feeds. It's about $20 a month for the paid version. I think there might be a free level. So you, there's something you could get in there and, and try out. There's other, I think, equivalent versions of Zencaster that are going to be very similar. Something to look into to see if that's a, an area where you could spend some money to make things easier on yourself, especially if you've got multiple people participating. I use Loopback to do my interviews. Loopback is a little piece of software. I think it was about a hundred bucks, but I found it really useful because it enables me to take full audio tracks right into GarageBand through any other. It lets me grab the audio from Skype, for example. I've used also grab the audio from Facebook Messenger conversation from zoom things like that and jen are you recording multiple audio tracks on your interviews no that's one thing is audacity doesn't i don't risk having the audio come over line over the internet mm. because it can lag so i get the other person to record their audio locally okay. and then send me the mp3 it had varying results i had one person who didn't put their headphones in when they recorded so i got the audio back and was like oh my goodness i can hear myself and i had to edit Hmm. really scrub that one to get it to work but yeah audacity doesn't let you do that so that's one of the benefits of having something like Zencaster. Yeah. it also puts less burden if you're interviewing people less burden on the other person i guess i'm just a terrible person <laughs> no no i had forgotten about that actually that's a really good solution i think more and more people are able to do that even if it's recording an, an audio message on their iphone you know those mm -hmm. are really high quality i know dan savage's podcast he takes audio messages from readers they always sound really good and a lot of them are recorded into their iPhones, you know? So that's another solution. There are creative ways around a lot of these solutions that don't cost very much money. Mm -hmm. And looking into what's out there, really spending some time, if you have problems, 
there are people out there that have the solutions. You know, I've watched tons and tons of YouTubes. I had to watch YouTubes to figure out how to use Loopback, you know, how to use GarageBand, things like that. There's a lot of information out there. There's another website that I have somewhere, but yeah, I would say, you know, really Google the different platforms. Yeah. Okay. I think that's about that for that topic, right? I think so. I would just quickly say that editing, you can, you can do like a cheap and easy edit where you can just remove all the blank sounds, or you can spend a lot of time really polishing and going in and cutting out every single um and ah. A trick I learned actually is when I'm interviewing people, I'll make a note if like, you know, bash table at X time, coughed at this time, and then I'll do a cheap and easy, go through the whole thing and cut out those major mistakes, trim the audio trim out any blank sounds but leave in all the ums and ahs because I can't be bothered to put that much effort in so you can find tricks to make editing easier because editing is like my least favorite part of podcasting yeah. Yeah. I get my spouse to do the otaku spouse podcast oh, nice. he's in charge of editing that so you're recording that on the yeti just like in the room when you guys are having a conversation yeah. okay yeah okay nice okay I have some other questions about your prep for those podcasts. I don't know if we went past that, but maybe we'll come back to that. I'm curious. Yeah, there are so many different ways you can do these things. Yeah. So once you've recorded the podcast, you have to get it online somehow. And the way you do not do that is by just uploading an MP3 to your website. Yeah. So when you host a website, you normally have a limit for how much data you can use on your website because, you know, the host has the server. And every single time somebody accesses your website or downloads something from your website or, you know, opens a picture or something, it uses data. And I think I have about three gigabytes limit every month. And when you have three files that are, what, 200 megabytes an episode, and if even 100 people download, that's your limit gone, like, instantly. And so you don't want to upload MP3s directly unless you have a host that provides unlimited you know bandwidth which one of my friends has he uses unlimited bandwidth host which he has to again pay extra for but it means that he can upload directly to his website but there are other options that are either paid or free where you can safely upload your podcast without crashing your website yeah and there's there's a lot of different options tons of options there's free options that you can give a test run to i use libsyn liberated syndication it's like 15 dollars a month and it's relatively easy and i think all of these are integrated once you've got your host these are special hosts that have large data plans so you're not getting podcasting hosts and once you've got it online they're going to be the ones that send that connection out to all these podcasting systems apple spotify Google, Amazon, these are all ways to access podcast content Mm -hmm. these days. And you need these hosts to share your podcast with them and get it out to the world. Yeah, I did a bunch of research and I found Anchor was the best for me because again, I don't want to pay. I will spend money on a fancy mic, but I do not want to subscription services. So Anchor was free and I could just upload the podcast and it will auto-populate. And I listen to podcasts through an app called Podbay which takes from Apple because I don't want to listen to Apple. So you can also see whether your podcast has successfully gone out by checking your own like pod app, whatever it is you use, because these podcast hosts are really good at, like Daniel said, sending them out to all the major hosts that people listen to podcasts through. Yeah. Podcast Insights is a website that I found that has pretty good research into lots of different topics, including microphones and stuff. But that might be somewhere you can start to look at stuff. But yeah, I have friends who also use Anchor. One of my friends from high school has a podcast. He's ranking all like 200 Beatles songs or something, ranking the Beatles, a great podcast. And he uses Anchor. A lot of these also have ways to integrate advertising into your podcast. Mm -hmm. I don't know much about that because it's not something I've done. Don't think that I have the listenership to really warrant anything like that yet, but it's out there. You know, there was one podcast that I was listening to that just shut down called The Content Minds. And their last episode would be a very interesting podcast to go listen to because they're talking about the decision to shut it down and the number of listeners you would need to really justify doing an ad-based model. And I think it was something like 5,000 or 10,000 in episode listeners. I think that's why a lot of podcasts do subscription. Yeah. Like, oh, this episode is sponsored by blah, blah, blah. Yeah. (laughs) But... If you don't want to turn it into a business, if you don't want to make it a part of your business, you don't have to do that either. 
they were running a Patreon. So they did have some subscription content, but it was mostly access to a Discord and the audio content was free. I think they were getting close to like, you know, 3,000, 5,000 listeners. This is a guy who also writes the garbage day. I want to say, no, he's a pretty interesting writer, R Ryan Broderick, someone to look into in terms of best practices for blogging, writing newsletters. And also to see what his podcast did, maybe why he couldn't push it past kind of like hobby podcast into a job podcast, I think. Yeah. Okay. I think we are good there. Let's see. So what are the current states of our podcast? Yeah. So I think I briefly mentioned this translation chat I did in two, 10 episodes one year, 10 episodes the next year, releasing two seasons. I decided not to do another, like I actually only intended to do it for 10 episodes and then see what happened. And it was you know, successful enough, I thought a second season was warranted, but I don't know if I'll put the effort in this year to do a third season. And instead, I barely did recommendations last year. So because I want to focus on more fun things, I'm going to try and release one episode of recommendations for my Tucker spouse this year, a month, and then again, see where it goes. Like it's, again, not putting so much pressure on myself that I'm like, I have to do this. I have to release these regularly. Just, you know, giving myself the freedom to be like, okay, yeah, I think I'm done now <laughs> or to do what I want to do what I find enjoyable and yeah. I'm actually surprised that we've got 54 episodes of the podcast out after what four five years I guess that's actually not a lot over five years <laughs> it feels a lot to me no like 10 a year that's really impressive I would say that's that's impressive yeah I'm kind of in the same spot did 10 episodes that first season the second season I basically did the same thing except I did the the kind of pre-prepared written content that I did uh, away from the interviews and then yeah I kind of after that didn't have time because I was doing IUC and then job hunting and now starting a job and not really motivated to do that but I am working on another season of the podcast potentially something totally different and it's really taken over my life since this year <laughs> and I'm still debating whether or not to push the eject button and let the plane crash into the desert without anybody seeing it but we'll see I think I'm going to do it but we'll see it could be interesting but before we be shifting topics a little bit I do have one question for Jen and I think this might be interesting is that when I did my podcast, I sent people like, you know, maybe four or five questions like I, that I thought were core questions that were, I think, you know, what did you learn? How did you learn Japanese? Is there anything that you remember that was particularly helpful? Or is there anything that you wish you would have done differently? Something like that. And getting a few of those answers before we started talking helped me familiarize with their situation. So I wasn't going in blind, but also there was enough space to kind of explore topics as they came up. What's your process in terms of generating or getting ready for a podcast? And I'm very curious because what prep do you do for my Otaku spouse? Or is it completely off the cuff? And then how is that different from the prep you do for translation chat? Yeah, so for translation chat, it's very similar to yours. I actually picked the model for that from your podcast, <laughs> sending people out questions so they can think about it and then hopefully send me replies. So I was also, like you said, aware of what they were going to say. And then also kind of can direct the conversation to make sure that we cover everything they want to talk about. But yeah, recommendations for my talk as far as is completely off the cuff. Before an episode, we will maybe say, oh, I want to talk about this. I want to talk about this. But try not to actually say the thing we want to talk about, because I've noticed that if you have a discussion about it in advance, then you'll think, oh, I've already mentioned this and then forget to mention it in the episode. Mm. So yeah, Otago Spouse is completely off the cuff. We have a couple of things on the back burner that we are watching mm. or reading and then we'll be like oh hey we could talk about this and then we pick a day we both have energy and then record an episode that is a lot more you know chill not so much pressure it's, it's probably why i enjoy it because they feel really structured and organized and like <laughs> together i'm really impressed that's really cool i think that's very hard to do oh it's like you said you're gonna find people who you have good chemistry with i guess that's the problem with an interview is that it's a little more professional which isn't necessarily a bad thing. And that I think some people are very interested in that kind of stuff, but yeah. Great. So we're going to recommended podcast. Yeah. <laughs> so because everybody here are translators and these are honestly, they weren't three that I find really interesting. A smart habits for our translators, speaking of translation and marketing tips with translators. I think these are all really great podcasts. They have different formats and different styles of giving people information. And I think they're also just really useful. I have a number of podcasts I also listen to for fun, but I'm kind of embarrassed to share them, so I'm not going to. Yeah, I will open the vault. So Pure Tokyo Scope is a great podcast, relatively new from Matt Alt and Patrick Macias. I'm sure that you're all are familiar with them. He's in the Japan anime community, written some great books. They, they have great chemistry. You can really kind of understand that they're friends and have been 
you know, hanging out and talking for a long time. Derek G speaks volumes is a guy who got blew up on TikTok. It talks about music recommendations, hi-fi, audio, headphones, things like that. It seems like he's speaking off the cuff and has experience working as a radio DJ. So someone to listen to in terms of how he's doing that. Bill Simmons, I've been listening to since like 2006. Sports writer initially for ESPN, then Grant Land now at The Ringer. He's got a whole network of podcasts, and I think he's doing a lot of things right. Although, you know, I find that I'm kind of getting a little bit tired of some of his content, but I listen to some of his guests all the time. He's got every NFL season, he does guest the lines with Cousin Sal, and their chemistry, I think, is just phenomenal. Even if I'm not following football, it's something I'm interested in listening to. Animal Spirits is a investing a finance lifestyle podcast with these guys, Michael Batnick and Ben Carlson. They're clearly like really close friends and I think have a great chemistry on their podcast. So they're working off of a Google document. You can kind of get a sense of that, but at the same time, their conversation comes off very naturally. Crew of Japan, Jen and I have both been on, talked about it earlier. That's a really, really good model in terms of how to split labor for a podcast, I think. There's clearly different people doing different jobs. The Office ladies, Jenna Fisher and Angela Martin were both on The Office. I enjoyed their their conversation. You can, again, these are they're two really close friends. And then IGN Nintendo voice chat. IGN is like a video game website and there's they have some great, hilarious people on there. Industry legend Kat Bailey and Rebecca Valentine, I think, have great chemistry, really good at kind of talking to video game content. So I think these are all places to kind of get inspiration from, see what other people are doing, to learn some of the best practices. Okay. Yeah. So now that we've gone over, like, we've just bombarded everyone with information about blogging and podcasting. I was like, why should I actually do this? Yes. What, what is the benefits besides having fun? Yeah, I think, you know, you're building up a portfolio for yourself. If you're looking to get into freelance writing, if somebody loads up your website, they're basically going to be looking at a writing sample immediately. And if they can say, oh, you know, this is somebody who's been blogging for so long, they can keep digging through content. Also, you know, I think about people who are just discovering my website. They've got material to go back through and read if they find something that interests them. That, I think, is a really big reason mm -hmm. to get online and get started. It also shows that you have sort of an area of expertise in a certain subject. Like, I keep trying to get my spouse to write about card game translation and about board game translation because he has a lot of knowledge that nobody knows that he has a lot of knowledge about. And so writing about these things shows, hey, I actually know what I'm talking about. So if you approach someone to be like, oh... I'd love to work on this project. I actually know what I'm talking about here. There's 10 articles I wrote where I gushed about this one thing because I think it's amazing. Yeah, it's a great way to connect with editors too. The Japan Times kind of found me through that 1Q84 live blog that I mentioned. And I reached out to that editor later when I was starting to feel the itch to kind of do some paid writing, trying to switch out from working as a project manager at a translation company. I was like, kind of like stagnating there. So needed to try and do something different. That was a great way to connect. Yeah, and I guess it also ties into when you're promoting and when you're chatting with people and when you're engaging in the discussions, it connects you with like other people who are interested in the subject or with other translators and publishers and, you know, people in the industries that you are a part of or want to be a part of. Yep. And then again, this is kind of like building a portfolio, but when you start to pitch editors, you've got writing samples, you've got lots of content to, to point to. So, you know, when you're sending out a pitch, you know, you need to have an idea of what you want to write for somebody else. And then you need to say, oh, and here's something similar that I've written that you can see. And here's a link to it. I think that's effective. As well as, you know, you might find opportunities to write articles for other websites that they'll pay you for, which is nice when that happens. Like, or you'll have call for writers for magazines, things like that. And so it can lead to more paid writing work in the fields, again, that you're interested in. Yeah, I think it inevitably, once you, you get a little bit of success, will also lead to offers for unpaid work. I think yeah. <laughs> it's funny, you need to do some unpaid work, I would say. That's one thing I asked a, a, one of my professors in my master's program, you know, how much unpaid work should you do? And his answer was some, which kind of made sense, you know, and like looking back, you know, I've, I've been guilty of trying to get people to do unpaid work. I think when I was in my 20s, I when I didn't really understand what was going on. You need to try and pay people for writing, I would say, these days. And, you know, even as recently as, you know, a week or two ago, had somebody saying, oh, can we republish your Substack post or your blog post on our website? It'll get you more views. You know, it'll, you can reuse old content, which I hadn't even, you know, I just didn't want to do the unpaid work and basically said that. And 
kind of indirectly the first time and then had to respond again and say, I'm not looking for unpaid work right now. But Jen reminded me when we met over lunch that there's another good reason to not do something like share your blog post, which is... Oh, yeah. So again, I, I keep mentioning search engine optimization is when you when you have the same text on multiple websites, exactly the same text. Google will be like, oh, this is just somebody copying and pasting for search engine optimization. So I'm going to punish that website. So it can actually damage your website in the long run because Google thinks that you're trying to trick the system and will, you know, push it down the results. And also if you have a really big website that is using other people's, like it's, this is republished, reshared from this website, you know, they get a lot more people coming to their website. And so they're getting probably a lot of ad content. And so they're probably making a lot of money off of just literally copying other people's blogs and probably highly likely not paying them for it. So again, it's not really worth it because somebody else is benefiting from your hard work. So I get, I actually similarly got a message saying, oh, can we copy this article onto our website? You'll get loads of exposure. And I was like, no, but I would be willing to write something from scratch, something new and original. What do you think? And they're like, oh, we'll get back to you. And then I never heard back. But, you know, it's just something to be aware of that there are people out there who will try to take advantage of your website, even if it's something small and be like, oh, can you write about this topic for us? Or can you share this link? for us and they are just trying to play the system so they can appear high on google when they don't just necessarily deserve it and they know which which pages they want to put their link into they're like we want you to put this little ad into this page because they know that's the page that everybody's going to so i would be very wary of anybody who's contacting you unless they're contacting you with an offer for paid work somewhere for completely new writing i would say and then even then you want to be careful you know do i maintain the rights to this for republication you know that's something that you make sure you're keeping and make sure they're not editing because your name's attached to it and if they edit something that you didn't say yeah which happened to me once and I got rather annoyed at them and I didn't go back to their website again. So like, for example, when I write for the Japan Times, I maintain the rights to the original pre-edited content and they run the edits by you before it goes out. So it's all pretty above board. Yeah. So what about opportunities for non-writing? Yeah, I guess we mentioned this in the last one, name recognition. I know when I've applied to jobs in the past, people have gone, oh, I read your article on blank, blank, blank you know, I'll give you a chance to do our translation test or, you know, I found it really interesting. I thought you'd be a good fit for this. And so that has actually led to, you know, work opportunities indirectly. Like people didn't contact me through the website, but when I applied to places, they're like, oh, I actually, I know, I know who you are. Yeah. For me, I would say, I don't know if I've gotten jobs because of or in spite of, but I would say, you know, post-grad school at that point, let's see, that would have been 20, 13 when I was job hunting and then again in 2018. So at that point I had been blogging for five years and 10 years. And when I got a job at the Japanese consulate in Chicago, I would say it was probably a good example of interest in Japan and maybe commitment to a project. And then when I got a job with the trade association in Chicago in 2018, they were initially looking for somebody with just Japanese language experience, but then they kind of rewrote the job description around my skill set to include some writing responsibilities for their publications. And so basically I was rewriting our members' content for our publications. And these are all international members, so not native English speakers. And then with Japanese, I was doing a lot of translation and things like that, or reworking translations. And so I think those kind of skills will be, you know, you're able to exemplify those through a successful blog. I think also this is more personal for me, but through I'd say through the blog and mostly through Daniel, I was connected to the Japan Times and through releasing an article about, I think it was a Squid Game translation on the Japan Times, but he involved in TEDx, like put me up for as a possible talk speaker. And then they listened to my podcast. So they knew I could speak. I can speak like a human. <laughs> they knew I could speak. And so I got in contact to do a TED talk last year and that was pretty exciting. It's not online yet. But before anybody asks, it's not online yet. But when it is, I plan to share it through sweat. But that was pretty exciting. That was something I was never, ever expecting, you know, a tiny blog and a little podcast to evolve into. And you also, you know, getting invited to talk at conventions or on other podcasts or write for other websites and things like that. So there's all kinds of random opportunities you might have never expected through, you know, creating content for people. Yeah, no, it's fun. It's part of being part of the conversation, I would say, you know. 
super exciting times to be a writer. I feel like, you know, I don't know how they did it in the 70s and 80s or even the 1870s and 80s, right? Like they were all making zines, I guess, to be honest, like more or less. But it's a great time to be involved. Yeah, pretty easy to get off the ground running. Let's see what's our next well, topic. It takes time. So you got to slowly build up. So yeah. I think that's basically towards the end of the content. Yeah. Is there anything that we want to ask each other before we let people I ask think, their own questions? I think we covered everything. Yeah. Right. Okay. So Q and A. Does anyone have any questions? I see there is one. It's not necessarily something that you need to answer verbally, but there's a request for a link to the Mild Taku Spouse podcast. Uh, <laughs> Make sure you yes. do that. You can put that in the chat at yes. some point when you have a chance. So you don't have to stop and do it right now. I'm not stopping it. This and take a sec. I do have to say that the spouse one is kind of a collective with some friends. So a whole bunch of us do different podcasts, all kind of are based around Japanese media. But there we go. Oh yeah, I'm curious to know more about that. Actually, how that get started? What's the format? How many podcasts are involved? And then how are you all connected? Yeah, some some friends in America. We do quizzes at anime conventions, or at least my me and my spouse were involved before we moved to Japan. And then two of them had been doing podcasting for years called Annie Bros. And so we were like, oh, you know, we should get involved with the podcasting too. And so we ended up making like Annie Bros Creative as like a group of friends. Some of us do Real Japan, which is about sort of Japanese movie adaptations, like really bad B movie <laughs> adaptations of Japanese media. And then me and my spouse do Otaku Spouse. So it was more like I know we're just a big friend group and we all do our own podcasts, but it's all kind of linked together. So again, very personal and it's kind of weird that the streams are crossing and I'm talking about this on a professional <laughs> special interest group. I think there's a lot of room there for like to model, you know, if you can kind of group together to kind of promote, but also do some of the lifting in terms of legwork, supporting each other technically too. There's a lot of... Yeah, but we're all really lazy there. and some of the other podcasts haven't posted anything in forever. So <laughs> it works if it works. Exactly. Can I go next? Yeah. Okay, so Jennifer and Daniel, thank you so much for this very informative talk. One of my reasons for coming here today is because I have kind of a hobby through WordPress.com, and it's mainly comprised of interviewing Japanese people in Kyoto, just about their lives. So, and I'd like to kind of develop it some more. Until now, it's been kind of sporadic. And especially when COVID started, I wasn't able to get out as much to interview people anymore. And these conversations kind of happen spontaneously too. So it has to be just the right situation. Like I basically record the interview and then I transcribe it afterwards and translate it. And not everyone is into that. So it has to be the right person, the right time and when I'm not working. So that's been one of the challenges for me because I realized I have to, you know, update the blog regularly. But if I wanted to get into, for example, wordpress.org, which you mentioned, for example, I wonder, does that involve kind of like buying the domain? Or you mentioned some forms, but what is the most expensive or what is the best price? And how would I just go about developing my hobby blog? Yeah, I think you would have to buy a domain in order to get .org and then find your own host. What is the name? I'm sorry. Oh, oh I think you have to buy your own website domain. Mm -hmm. And it could be from like a WordPress themselves or through other, you know, other places where you can buy website domains. Yeah. I know there are so many out there. You really have to do some research into mm -hmm. what would be best, yeah. especially because they're also always changing. Mm. Like when I started, I used GoDaddy and that was a very British, I think it's still going. Yeah. So just one quick thing to start mm -hmm. with. So WordPress is a piece of software that runs on a server. You can either self-host it on a website or you can get wordpress.com to host it. And so if you're already on wordpress.com, the easiest way to do it would be to go through wordpress.com and to buy your domain through them. Mm -hmm. That would basically convert what you're currently using. So if you're, for example, blog.wordpress.com, you would become blog.com. Mm -hmm. And you would so it would look like you're hosting your own thing. That would be the easiest and I would say probably the most affordable way to do it. Whereas if you run it self-hosted, you have to one get the hosting package. So for example, my hosting package, I don't know exactly what it cost me, but I buy it in five-year intervals mm -hmm. and I think maybe even 10 year, I think so. And it's not that expensive. I would say for five years, I'm paying maybe $200 or something like that. And then at the same time, you need to buy the host, you need to buy the domain name, which is going to be another expense. And then there's only a couple other things that you need to buy. For example, when you register a domain name, you need to have your address associated with that domain name. Mm -hmm. and keep that address up to date. 
you can buy a special thing that keeps that address hidden from people. If you don't mm -hmm. want that address out there because it's publicly accessible information, mm -hmm. that's another payment that yeah. I think I don't do anymore. Mm -hmm. You can buy an S, uh, what is it? HTTPS certificate. I can't remember what it's called, but it's basically a certificate that they're requiring or not requiring, but they're incentivizing to improve the security of websites. So when they access your website, you're accessing through HTTPS and not HTTP. And mm -hmm. that's going to increase your visibility on search results as well. Mm -hmm. That's another thing that you'll be paying for. They start to add up. Again, for me, I put so much into the, the website already that I'm glad to pay them. But doing it through WordPress.com, I imagine that HTTPS is going to be built in. You're really only going to be paying for that domain name, and it's going to include a lot of other things in a single package. So if it's still just a hobby blog, you're trying to get off the ground, I would say that's probably the best next step, I would say. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I tried Foursquare for a little while, but mm -hmm. um, that didn't work out so well for me. I don't know. I just couldn't uh, get okay. with the design. Of anyway, thank you for that advice. Yeah. And then when you do a self-hosted one, you've kind of got to get into the back end a little bit. But someone like Namecheap makes it really easy, to be honest. Like I just had to update. I finally got the HTTPS last year for the first time, and it was a little bit complicated, but renewing it was a breeze, to be honest. Like I just clicked something and it reinstalled and I don't even, I kind of don't even know what I did, to be honest. Like <laughs> That's how easy Namecheap made it. So if you are looking to self-host, I really can't recommend Namecheap highly enough. It's been relatively affordable. And actually initially somebody had howtojapanese.com already when I started my website. And so I had to get how to Japanese, Japanese spelled J A Japanese. Japanese. And so eventually that person let their blog die and I snatched up the website name from godaddy.com and then had to transfer that over to Namecheap. So yeah, there's a lot of ins and outs, but WordPress.com too, I think, you know, they have an integrated community of readers. So there's a lot mm -hmm. of positives to WordPress.com. Like I said, when you put up a blog post on WordPress, you give it a category name, but at the same time, you're giving it keywords. I can't remember what it's called, but basically hashtags, you know, more or less that are associated with that post. And that's how people found my Kickstarter blog. I connected with another guy who was obsessed with Kickstarter and a couple other people and was able to get readers pretty quickly. So I think there's a lot to be said to starting on WordPress.com or mm -hmm. Blogger, something like that. And I'll close with this question, but would buying a domain on WordPress.com kind of be going into the WordPress.org or is that just a completely different? It's, it's separate. It's di separate, yeah. So you'd have to move your website over to the new software. Yeah, so if you think about it as buying a lot for a house, right? So with WordPress.com, you're buying this fully built apartment and if you pay them different things, they'll make it a nicer apartment for you. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're buying WordPress.org, you got to buy the land. <laughs> and then you got to bring in your own crane to crank up the WordPress <laughs> server onto your thing. And then once it's sitting there, you're like, all right, now you got to get running. And, you know, and you have to build the apartment yourself to a certain extent. Obviously, a lot of themes and stuff that are quite automatic, but you need to make sure they're being updated. That's one thing. If you've got a, you know, a, a self-hosted installation, you need to make sure the security is good so that you're not getting hacked and delete it off the internet like I did temporarily, you know. A host can also help with that. Like yes. my host yes. is this guy who actually does it as a hobby rather than a company. And so I like message him and I'm like, I've been hacked, help. Or I don't think my website's secure enough and he'll do his magic. And I'm like, okay, yeah, it works. Yeah, thank you very much. We have a question in chat. How do you know if you're enough of an authority on a topic to write or speak about? And do you have any suggestions if there's a topic you really enjoy, but the act of actually writing about it seems less enjoyable? Mm, good questions. <laughs> really good questions. Yeah, I think when I started, I wasn't really much of an authority. I just wrote my thoughts, like very early blogs. You can go read them. Please don't. They're really bad. <laughs> uh, they were just like opinion pieces, like, oh, I really like this. I think this is cool. And then I slowly, over the years, built up. Like, it's not really even the authority. It was still just interest. I guess... If it's something that you're really interested and passionate about, I think that's enough of an authority, especially if you're willing to put in the extra work to do some research to make sure you're not, you know, spouting nonsense. What do you think, Daniel? Yeah, no, I totally agree. You're kind of walking off a cliff onto an invisible platform to a certain extent, and you have to avoid the imposter syndrome as much as possible. And I still remember the post where I made a mistake or somebody called me out. You've got to be open to that. I wish I would have handled certain situations differently, but at the same time, other situations I think I handled really well. I think that's all part of the process of becoming a better writer, more knowledgeable about the topic. 
but you are taking a little bit of a leap of faith. That's another reason why I would say write 10 posts, you know, see what you can do. Try writing five to 10 posts, get that backlog, see how it feels, put them aside for a week, go back and read them again, and then see what, how they feel as a reader. I think that's a way to test it, but I would say just do it, you know? I think that it is a bit of a leap of faith, I think, when you're starting and you can write into the expertise over time, I would say. And then for subjects that you really enjoy, but the act of writing is probably less enjoyable. I think I can help with this one. So when I started writing for the Japan Times last year, the year before last, fairly recently, very recently, up to that point, I'd been writing advice columns on my website. It's like, here are some tips for improving your self-editing and here are some tips for how to study Japanese. And so they were very instructive. When I started writing for the Japan Times, I was like creating the same style of writing and it wasn't enjoyable. And my editor changed everything. And so I felt like crap because I felt like I wasn't doing a good job. <laughs> and this, this is something I've only done very recently was reapproach the subject from a different angle. How can I make it enjoyable for me and therefore hopefully more enjoyable as a reader? And sort of having more of a story approach and more of a narrative style of writing rather than instructive. And I think approaching the subject that you're interested in from a different angle and thinking, okay, how could I write about this that I would enjoy reading? How can I present this information in a more entertaining way? And I think that can definitely make a subject that you're interested in, but the thought of writing about it daunting a little more interesting again. It's like, how can I write about this? How can I approach this differently? And how can I write about it in a way that does make me? you know, want to write about it and not dread the thought of chugging out 900 words because I have to. Yeah, I would respond with one quick question, which is that, is it the topic or is it just the act of writing? Because writing is hard, man. Writing is always hard. It's always a struggle, you know. Actually, it reminds me of when I was in college, I went to this professor that I was studying with and he was, you know, very edai and I was very, you know, ninense and I asked him, does Japanese ever get any easier? And he's like this, you know, 50 year old man, I'm like 19. And he's like, no, <laughs> it's always a struggle. And I was like, ah, but it's not true. It's not true. It gets easier, you know, like it totally gets easier. And I would say the same for writing. It's, you know, since it's always a struggle, but I would say like doing something like running where the first time you run a mile, it's going to feel like you're out of breath. The first time you run a 5K, you're going to feel like, oh God, I'm never doing that again. Then you go back to it, you know? And by the time you know it, I think if you're doing it regularly, if you put yourself through a programmatic schedule, you know, where you're setting a goal once a week, you know, three times a week, once a month, whatever it is, sticking to that routine, I think you'll get to the point where you're like, oh man, I just wrote 2000 words. Like it was nothing. And I can't wait to go edit them so that they're better and I've improved them. Yeah, I was just going to say, well, there's a break. I wasn't really sure what kind of answers I was going to get asking those questions, but I feel a little better about that. So I really appreciate it. Thank you. Good. Maybe not the running. I'm still really bad at that. But <laughs> well, the good news is that you only have to run with your fingers. So, okay. And then Gino's got a question. I was going to ask actually how to handle audience engagement and criticism, which can be non-constructive at times. Ignore all the comments. Don't read the comments. Yeah. That's a good, that's a good suggestion. No. I actually don't tend to get many comments on my websites, but if I get criticism online, normally it's clear that the person hasn't actually read the article. They've just seen somebody else complaining about something. And that's when I ignore. Mm -hmm. For me, there's two levels to responding to criticism. And one is dealing with my emotional response to criticism. Whenever you, if you're not used to it, that criticism will feel very loud than it actually is on the, on the page or in reality, for me at least. And so I find that taking a breath, forgetting about it for a minute and coming back to it is really the most important thing to do because then you're not going to react from that. You're not going to respond from that point of initial kind of primitive monkey brain, you know, emotional response. You're going to respond from a more measured writer point of view. That's always been helpful for me, first of all. Second of all, delete any comments that you don't like. Just get rid of them. I wrote a post after one of the shootings in the U.S. where it was just mostly looking at the word, you know, in Japan, it, I can't remember exactly what it was like, or something like that, where they, all the samurai collected all the weapons, all the swords from Japan. And it was a very, you know, it's not the deepest and most apt comparison, but it's an interesting look at the way that Japan developed. And obviously 
it's a complex subject. It's not as easy as just collecting all the swords, right? That's not exactly what happened in Japan. But it was, you know, I thought an interesting word to look at in context and came from a place of wanting there to be more gun regulations. There was a guy who posted a couple of comments and I responded to him. Mm -hmm. And then I just deleted them all because I was like, I don't need this on there. This is just an idea I wanted out there. And I wish I hadn't responded in the first place. And I had just deleted his comment initially because who cares? You know, he's a crazy right wing nut job, or even if he's not, if he's coming from a place of more measured, you know, support for the Second Amendment, I don't need that on my website, you know. But then again, you know, there are times when I think it's important to leave that up there and actually respond to somebody and have a constructive conversation. But again, once you let the volume kind of come down on that receiving criticism, I think it's easier to respond in a more effective way. I think one of the things, especially on social media, where you obviously can't delete other people's, you know, Twitter tweets or anything like that, is when you engage in conversation like that, you're not trying to convince the other person. You're trying to give a rational argument for the people who are not engaging in the conversation. They're reading your response and they're judging you based on that. And so if you give, you know, a mature response to criticism, then walk away and that's how you portray yourself. And I think people see that. And really, it's not the person whose knee-jerk reaction is to fling swear words at you because that paints them in a bad light. Luckily, I haven't been too involved in many of those kinds of conversations online because they make me (laughs) depressed. The other thing that I think can be really helpful is just mastering basic rhetoric. It's something that I wasn't ever really taught effectively until Mm. I had to teach it in grad school and was suddenly promoted from teaching writing one to writing two, basically. And Instead of writing one, I was really familiar with because it was just getting used to writing, you know, writing process and writing two was rhetoric and, you know, basic logical arguments, reasoning, all the different logical fallacies. Getting familiar with those is really an arsenal to pick apart bad thinking and bad writing. So I don't... I think it'd be good for your own writing as well. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. I don't have a great recommendation for like an introductory text or anything like that, but I think searching one of those out to be like, well, that's an odd ad hominem. Like, this isn't even an argument I'm going to take seriously because you're just attacking me and not my point that I'm making. You know, that's an easy way to, I would say, take out like 80 to 90% of comments that happen on the internet, to be honest. That's a good point. And so the next comment or question, I guess, is like, I have an idea for this blog for my own knowledge, but felt it might be fun to share compare excerpts of Japanese with the official English translation and see what we can learn about the challenges of localization content steeped in cultural history. However, my original idea involves copywritten content on the post. I've seen similar formats on other blogs like Legends of Localization, but would it be better to abandon the actual experts excerpts to write on localization itself to avoid legal infringement? I think that comes under fair use, I believe. If you are writing for educational purposes or satire, you are free to share content. But obviously, you can't post an entire book and be like, I'm criticizing it. But I think taking excerpts of something and then using it as a platform for discussion is not going to piss anybody off, or at least not be a legal issue. Yeah. yeah, a good example there is there's been, I would say, at least two or three people that I know of who have discovered Murakami's book of short short stories, Yoru no Ozaru, The Spider Monkey Comes at Night. I think Jay Rubin translated it with that title, or at least gave it that title in his book. And it's these two or three page stories that when people discover them, they're like, oh my God, these are amazing. I can translate these. I want to try and translate them because they're so fun and creative. And people have tried to put those on blogs before and gotten takedown notices. But If you're just doing an excerpt, I think that's totally fair. I don't know what the legality of like screen images would be like, but if you're just looking at the text, I think there's no issue with that. In terms of regulations on how much, I think that's also a good question. You know, like I looked into this recently for sharing screenshots from Japanese dramas and most Japanese websites says that as long as there's like a point, it needs to be some kind of substantial content or comment that you're making on it. But in terms of text, I would feel comfortable sharing up from like a paragraph to maybe like a page or page and a half, two pages of content, and then digging into what's going on and making sure you're block quoting it or something like that. So you're making very clear what this is, that you're you're citing it. This is why citation is important to, you know, like where it is, what page it's on, who's the author, who's the translator, so that you're not making it look like your own content. And then 
providing substantial comment on your own. So it's not just a blog post that's one page from Kami's latest translation and then the Japanese original from his own work. I think that on its own might be a little bit dicier. When I write translation reviews, I tend to, I think at max, take a paragraph, but even then that's not really a lot because Japanese paragraphs are so short, <laughs> like maybe three sentences and then compare it to the English translation and then have a little discussion about it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I think that's I've looked at Murakami's translation or writing for years. You know, one thing that I do every September is look at untranslated Murakami writing and kind of track his career and what he's doing. I spent six years blogging the translation of Hardball Wonderland and Into the World. And actually, that's what I was on Jen's podcast for, which that was a lot of fun. Because I had spent, you know, six years blogging it, looking at the close differences between the translation and the original, what was changed. And then actually what Murakami changed between versions of his work from the original to the complete works edition that was published five years later. So, and then, yeah, I think it's all been relatively fair use. And again, I'm writing extensive commentary on these things and citing them and making it clear that this is like literary analysis project rather mm -hmm. than repurposing content or reusing something for other reasons. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah. Another question. Asking for peer reviews, perhaps. I don't think anybody really peer reviews blogs. <laughs> you could probably ask, you could probably run it by somebody you trust and be like, Hey, can I get your opinion? Do you think I might get in trouble if I write this? I mean, that's a good idea if you are worried about it. Yeah. Next question. This question goes a little off topic, but maybe you two know something about this. Are there groups, classes, or resources that you're aware of that focus on creative writing in Japanese or non-native speakers slash learners of Japanese? Isn't that what you did, Daniel? Ooh, that's a good question. Yeah. So I did the I IUC Inter University Center for Japanese Language Studies. I'm sure we have a couple other alums in the group as well, being at Lisa. And that's a very intensive language program. And I think if you, I kind of focused on Jap writing in Japanese as my like final project. There, in terms of actually creative writing classes in Japanese, I'm not familiar with them. I mean, your best bet there would be to look at classes with the target audience is Japanese people. I think that's going to be your best bet there, maybe through community centers or something like that. I don't know anything right offhand, but yeah, it's something I'm really interested in. I actually have a secret Japanese blog that I started not too long ago, but it's gotten completely derailed by my new podcast preparation. But I was posting like once every two weeks or something on that. Which is really interesting. One tip I have there, which is use Google Documents to compose because Google Docs has grammar recommendations in Japanese, which is incredible. So it will tell you if your was and gas are wrong, or if you're, you know, if something's not making sense, it'll suggest changes and things like that. If your knee should be a day or something like that, it has, I would say, obviously, you know, it's not perfect, but can be very helpful for something like that. So I've been drafting all my material for that blog in Google Docs. I didn't know that either. I think I might have to start doing that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, even for emails for work, I think it can be incredible resource. Yeah. I do have to say that, that creative writing styles are different between Japan and the West. So in English versus Japanese. And so if you do do creative writing and you want to get into Japanese creative writing, then learning more about how Japanese stories are structured, it's definitely something that's worth investigating. Mm -hmm. But yeah, other resources, I would say... I can't think of any other resources. No, I don't know any. In terms of for like advanced foreigners, I would say at that point, you might think about, like I know Dogen actually talks about that too. I can't remember when it was, whether it was before he got into pitch accent stuff or after, but at one point it sounded like he was writing fiction in Japanese or trying to write fiction and having people read it and things like that. So you might look into his material too, because he talks all about that in some of his YouTube videos. I think some of the ones that are accessible for free, that might be a good resource to see there. But again, I would say, you know, at some point, like any advanced language class becomes a native level language class, which is, you know, workshopping writing. They don't have quite the same workshop system that we have in the U.S. and England, maybe a little bit. The U.S. has a really big writing workshop community. I don't know what that's like in Japan, but you have to imagine that there is some kind of community center, at least that's offering writing classes for adults in Japan could be maybe the writers of Kyoto might have an oh, yeah. idea about local programs just a thought Oops. is there any other questions <laughs> I, I was just going to ask a question about that idea of participating in the conversation and building community and that's something I've kind of struggled with a little bit of just like I feel like I engage in discord groups or on reddit or different things and on twitter and I can do that but 
I feel like I have kind of my like personal stuff I engage with and then, but then my professional stuff, whenever I even see an opportunity that like, oh, like, yeah, I wrote a blog post about that or like I can do that or have something I want to say about it. I find it kind of ends up feeling like that capital N networky, like cringy Mm. kind of thing happens. I can kind of be part of the community, but I've never been able to bridge that to any of my professional work. And I wonder if you guys like have any thoughts on how you do that. Yeah, that's really hard. I also feel cringy when I'm like oh I actually wrote something about this if anyone's interested if you want (laughs) and then like put it in the reply but yeah I'm not trying to toot my own horn here but this is actually related to what we're talking about yeah I still feel awkward about that (laughs) I think doing it systematically can help saying whenever I do x I'm going to do y if I write a Mm -hmm. blog post I'm going to share it on LinkedIn my Facebook page my Instagram and my Twitter And that makes it a little bit more of a habit and you're not thinking about it too much. The other thing you can do is deconstruct it into a Twitter thread and make it more accessible in bits and pieces that way uh, Mm -hmm. for people and maybe hopefully draw some attention that way. In terms of responding to people and putting your link, I think you have to feel a little bit shamelessly about it. But again, I think one thing that's a really common thread between Jen and I is that our goal is to support different, maybe in Jen's case, the translation industry, in my case, Japanese learners. And so we're really trying to be supportive. And so if you can think about the goal from that point of view, I think that for me makes mm, it a lot easier. That makes a difference. Like that. You feel a little bit less icky about it. And to know that I've never really charged for my content, I feel you know pretty good about that too, at least. You know, it'd be nice to be able to make money off it. But it's, again, like I'm glad to just give back knowing how much support I've had from different organizations and individuals over my yeah. learning career. Just to give back is enormous. So maybe there's a way... You can find an angle like that. Yeah, I think people can tell when you are trying to help rather than I'm trying to sell this product. Like somebody yeah, somebody yeah. in a Discord group I'm in keeps posting things and you can tell they're selling this product. And I'm like, ugh, it feels so like slimy. But you can tell when someone's like, oh, I wrote this if you're interested. You might find this helpful. And so I think people can tell. And so even if you feel embarrassed about sharing it, then I think it's still worth trying. The worst yeah. people could do is just not click on it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, and I guess I kind of have to take a little bit of just like people will know that, yeah, that actually was really relevant to what we were talking about or something, right? Like, yeah. So, yeah. It looks like just to follow up the thread on the last comment, Cody in the comments says a plug for the Kyoto Consortium for Japanese studies. We run content courses in Japanese where students have to write journals or essays in Japanese, and our instructors will correct text for grammar and style. This chiefly for American undergraduate students. The workshop idea for writers is a great idea. Yeah. I am bookmarking that. I think, yeah, we're just over the limit. So I'll pass it back to Lisa. Thanks, you guys. That was amazing. A lot of good ideas. And people have already said that. I don't need to echo it, but thank you. I'll just give you official thanks. So why don't everyone like, unmute your mics and let's say our thanks and our goodbyes to jump in freely? Thank you so much. It was really great. Yeah. <laughs> And everybody, if you want to save your chat, you'll get all the information that was put up there. Yeah, so you can click on the three little dots within the chat function, and there's an option to save the chat there. So do that before you leave the meeting or before I close the meeting, if you want to to capture the chat. Actually, before we go, I'd love a link for Karen's blog, because the interviews with Kyoto people sounds really interesting. (laughs) Thank you. Okay, so let me me post that link here just a second. Anybody else have blogs that they'd like to yeah, blog? Yeah, share blogs. <laughs> no shame here. Yeah, I'll put the link to the sweat blog roll to add that to your collection. And this is just blogs that people have let us know about. We haven't actually asked everyone, do you have an interesting blog? So no doubt there are important ones that should be here and we should know about them and put them in because sweat depends on all your members for everything it does, we hope you will feed in information to the website and to the, on this topic, blog roll. Oh, I I love everyone sharing these now. We should have grabbed these earlier before. I wanted to just thank Daniel and Jennifer for so enthusiastically offering to do this talk and organizing it so well and welcoming everyone. And I, I think SWED is always evolving and I can see a lot of things in what we talked about today that could help sweat move into some of the new technologies, the sort of approaches to writing and and networking and finding ways to evolve our organization and our activities, which 
we really need to do because you know we have such a long history it's easy to just get stuck and not move on and i'm very hopeful that we can use some of the vast experience you have obviously accumulated so that we can keep on evolving as a society and help everybody in some way and i would like to make a plug for the sweat website which is the grandmama of the blogs it's the place where you can write and you can share with members and have something that stays and we do edit all the articles that go on to the website but our mission is to have articles that tell about our experience and share it with others who will be following us in doing what we're doing and we have articles and columns in different categories and if you have a look you can see what we're trying to build up it's unfortunately needs a lot of new material and thank you very much thank you lynn thanks, thanks. everyone, thanks, everyone. Yep, great to see everyone have a great day have a great weekend